are y'all doing tonight? I am so in voice actor mode that the moment that the song ended, I just like went into DJ mode and I was going to pause it and be like, cool, that was No Shame by Five Seconds of Summer. We're going back with the, you know, like, I don't even know what the fuck it was, but I was just about to just fully go into something that I have no idea what to say about. I, I don't know what was going to come next. What are we coming back to? I don't know, but we're coming back to it <laughs> right now. In five minutes, we're going to be, uh, what do they say? I haven't listened to the, a, an actual radio in a very long time, um, but they're usually like, you know, you want to win tickets to the weekend? <laughs> well, here's a here's a wacky question. What's the weirdest thing you found in uh, a, a partner's bathroom? Call us at 1-800-KISS-FM. <laughs> we'll be answering them live on the air, which seems like a bad idea. Evening sexy. Oh, right back at you. <laughs> How you doing, bro? I'm good. I'm good. I'm trying. Um, so I was. I didn't want to commit to coffee unless I knew that it would be a thing that I would be consuming on a somewhat regular basis. So I just got myself some Maxwell House or whatever and uh, was just fucking around with that. Uh, I'm gonna turn on the fan. Cause it's a little hot. I just did some cooking. And I made coffee. So when you got both, it's like, it's gonna heat up. I'm just gonna put it on, like, setting one. So that it doesn't make too much noise. Come on, buddy. Uh, but yeah, I've just been fucking with some Maxwell House. And, um... I'm gonna turn the sound down. Hopefully, y'all won't be able to hear. And I will be able to hear the speaker. But, uh, yeah, so I've just been, I've been fucking with some not great coffee. Because I wanted to, like, it's like a starter pet, you know, where you get a kid a goldfish before you get them a, a, a dog. To make sure they can keep that thing alive first. Uh, but they never do, because not even their fault. They could be taking great care of the goldfish, it's gonna die within, like, got all my fish just, like... And my friend's fish. I don't know a fish. I think I know of one fish of my friends that lasted more than like a year. And it lasted like six years or seven years. It was a ridiculous amount of time to, to live for a, a fish. But um, now I'm fucking with uh, Bones Coffee. Because I had a packet from... Um, I got my friend... Yoav, uh, the living tombstone, it was his birthday last year, and I got him some coffee, and I had to pay for shipping anyway, so I got, like, a little thing of, um, it's flavored, like, cereal milk, I think, uh, so I, I, I was like, you know what, if I'm gonna like coffee, I'm gonna hold on to that, and then I didn't drink it for a year, uh, but now it's a thing that I'm consuming. Um, not bad. It's not bad. Any kind of coffee i have to just drown it in in milk and sugar but that's not the healthiest so i'm trying to cut back on how much i can stand you know but um it's good to know that it's good so i ordered some more because if i'm going to consume this i might as well enjoy it it might might as well be a somewhat enjoyable uh experience hey j dubs thank you for the bits let me uh, pew. Did it work? There we go. I was like, I didn't hear it. <laughs> Did you say time for bits? Because here they come. Thank you, I really appreciate it. Um, you know, I need to... Well, I guess the bits animation is cool. But everything else, like, I've been living my life. I've been improving shit so much. I went into the settings today, and I fixed, or rather changed, uh, <clears throat> the animations for um, subscribing, following, and rating, and also, wait, subscribing, follow, raid, and then there was one more, I forget what it was, but I changed a bunch of animations, uh, I, I made GIFs from videos of mine, I also made a Khaleesi GIF. Uh, when, when, a, when a raid happens and when a, I 
think someone donates or something. But that that was a donation, so it should have popped up. Maybe bits are in a different category than than donations. I don't know, but I will. I'll fuck around. I'll try to see if I can fuck around with the bits donation too, because I want that to be personalized. Also, you know. Um. But yeah, what else? What have I been doing? Just just preparing, you know. Uh, I got to I got to enjoy the company of a, a cool person yesterday because um, neither of us are interacting with anyone else. You know, we're under quarantine and we're both like super like paranoid about germs and paranoid about like we need to flatten the curve. I'm not going to interact with any other humans. So neither of us have been interacting with any other humans. Uh, and that means that we are able to hang out uh, a once a week treat, basically. And so yesterday was that day, and that was that was a cool experience to see another human for the first time in in a while. That's coffee. But yeah, they're they're they they are a neat they're a very neat human. It's, and I feel like you have to be in order to, you know, because we met on um, where was it? Okay, Cupid, and it was during the quarantine. So you know, it has to be. You have to have a special interaction with a person for you to be like, "Hey, do you want to like hang out?" I mean, as much as we can during quarantine, uh, because we had both. It wasn't even gonna cross my mind because I'm very paranoid about like germs and and shit. And I've just stayed in my house. I have groceries delivered. I don't interact with anyone. Uh, I'm just like I'm very neurotic about it. Um, I'm anal about it, if you could say. Um, so I, I, there's like a 0% chance I would want to meet up with anyone. But then they were like, yes, I'm super paranoid. Also, I've been doing this, this, and this. And we kind of just like connected in a neat way, which is cool. But I don't see the quarantine ending in I can't see it ending for at least like four or five months realistically like at the earliest I think we're gonna be in this for a while because some people aren't being anal about it you know some people are just watching Fox News and Fox News says hey it's a hoax don't worry keep going to church and they're like cool and they go out and just like just French kissing in the park or whatever straight people do I don't know that's what movies taught me that they, they do. Uh, but I think, I, I, you know. <laughs> Mid-May, yeah. Because right now it's April. It just started April. It's April Fool's Day. Well, And I'm glad most people are just like, let's not do April Fool's Day. Like, I hated it before. But even now, it's like, we are, we're in hell right now. Can we just chill? Can we not? Um, can we not fuck around with that, please? I'm all for, like, harmless pranks. I like silly goofs, but, uh, you know, I just, I knew, like, it, it, it has probably happened, but I don't fucks with people like that, so that's probably why I haven't seen it, where someone might have gone on the internet and was like, hey, good news, guys, the coronavirus has a cure, and then everyone just beats the shit out of them because they're lying. <laughs> Clean my glasses. I saw a meme the other day that was like, I, uh, it's too easy to fight people with glasses because all you got to do is, and then they linked two pictures and one picture was, uh, fingers touching potato chips. And then the next picture was fingers touching glasses. And I'm like, yeah, that's all you have to do really to beat us in a fight. All you have to do is just get our glasses smudgy. <laughs> I do go out, but don't get close to anyone, and only going out once again, uh, once again to get groceries to last me a couple weeks at the very least. Oh, I am only, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, I, I'm, I'm very fortunate that I'm able to get groceries delivered, but if I had to go out in the world, I too would be, like, super conscious, conscious, cautious? Both. <laughs> uh, just be like, no one, no one get near me, please. Ugh. Because religious freedom, yes, yes. You can't 
impend on me putting my disgusting hands in the holy water and then having everyone else touch the holy water too? It's what Jesus would want. It really just, it feels like we're living in a, a parody world. It feels like a Black Mirror episode. Like, I'm just, I'm so disappointed. Because I went to Catholic school for like 11, 12 years. Like, I, I know how insane things get. But right now we're in the middle of a pandemic. And you literally have human beings that are in charge of cults. I'm sorry. The uh, churches. I don't know how, I don't know how that slipped through. Um, but they're, they're going to the front of lines in churches and just being like, don't worry, keep coming to church. It is a lie. What? <laughs> Where are you getting your information? Don't say that. <laughs> you think it's fake? You think people dying is fake? You're going to go go to the, the morgue and like talk to them? Be like, hey, get up. The prank is over. We know you're lying. Hmm. Hmm. Upside, Florida demanded people stay the fuck home. Downside, churches are considered essential services, so conservatives are still piling up together two days a week. Their funerals are just a domino effect. Oh boy. On one hand, it's like, well, at least natural selection is happening and the, the idiots are dying off, but there there are consequences for everyone from that. Ooh. But like one of the early Black Mirror episodes, I feel like the writing took a shift for the more uplifting after that. Oh, after that awesome uh, San Bernardino episode. San Bernardino. Oh, is that the same episode as San Junipero? Or did autocorrect do something silly there? Unless there's two different San episodes that I am forgetting. San Junipero was the name of the, the lesbian episode, right? Send you to Paro, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh. That was like, that was a good episode. <laughs> Buff white Jesus says, grope each other and mock people who don't want to die because of your selfishness. Yup. Oh. Yeah, yesterday was dope because it was Trans Visibility Day or whatever it was. And I celebrated by having sex with another trans person. So that's a... <laughs> Usually I don't... Uh... Well, I say that I don't kiss and tell. You know what I mean. I will tell stories if it's a, a funny thing or an appropriate thing or on a topic. But I don't usually go out of my way to be like, I got laid. Boom, bam, 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 bam. But yesterday is a special case because I feel I felt good. It was a good cum. It was like a, a a Duncan on the bigots cum. You know what I mean? Like it was like. <laughs> <laughs> I ordered cookies on Amazon. And Amazon, they arrived by Sunday. You you ordered? I guess you can. Yeah, I'm. I guess if it's like a brand, I was thinking more of Etsy stuff because I ordered cookies on Etsy once. <laughs> I'm proud of your cum, bro. Thank you. <laughs> pat on the pat on the back. Uh. Huh? <sighs> Pardon me. On that day of transgender people go outside do rainbow shoot out <laughs> shoot out of them. Yes. Um we have to be as visible as possible. It's it's a combination. Some people shoot out rainbows. Some of them um you know those little flashy triangles that you put if your car breaks down on the side of the road? Uh, those just kind of appear. Because we have to... It's like a lizard effect where the lizard gets scared and it goes... <laughs> and, it, and the thing sprouts out. Uh, it's like that, but it's the, the, the bright flasher things on the side of the road. You combed good? I combed good. That's, um, that's a combination of words that I... That I love, but also did not think I would ever see. Oh, I'm glad coffee isn't a slog anymore. You know, it's not, it's not terrible. Now, I did a ton of test things today. So I don't actually know if these follows are legit or if they were uh, generated by Stream Deck. 
but just in case, I might as well say them. Uh, <laughs> uh, Killa804, thank you for the follow. Vermillion7k, thank you for the follow. SMGKP, thank you for the follow. And uh, Minika Floop, thank you all for the follows. Now, a uh, question for you. I'm going to... I'm going to do the air horn once just now, and I just want y'all to like, because I have a speaker set up, I just want to make sure you, it's, it's quiet enough that y'all aren't hearing it twice. So I'm going to do the, the air horn once, and let me know if you hear it twice or once. Because <sighs> I can totally turn it down, I just uh, want to make sure. Hey, have a good night, Rodolphus. Now that your uh, daily nonsense quota has been met. <laughs> hope you all have a good night and day tomorrow. Thank you. I will. I hope you do as well. Just heard it the one time? Dope. Okay. Yeah, the problem is that people need uh, body counts to take a disease seriously. Like how conservatives took Ebola seriously. Yet if a disease kills you too quick, the virus can't spread. Whereas Corona, Corona Chan has the potential to take out possible millions. Yeah, it's scary. Uh, <laughs> they, uh, what was it? Do you, um, do you know Folding Ideas? He's a, a, a YouTuber that I follow, uh, Dan Olson. Uh, I love his stuff. He's, he's, you know, really, really smart dude, uh, who does, I don't know how to describe his content. Uh, he talks about film. A lot uh folding ideas if you want to just you know search him uh i recommend subbing to him but uh he did a video recently he's canadian and um a little i i believe he's um immunocompromised uh i would have to double check on that but i think he talks about it in the video that i'm about to uh tell you about but he did a video i think just yesterday where he talks about how he can't stop watching the movie contagion uh and it's super interesting and i just i'll i'll absorb like whatever he fucking puts out but that uh it hits home and it's very vulnerable and it's very um it's kind of like a comforting hug like we've all just kind of been thinking this but no one's saying it out loud <laughs> so i uh i appreciate it and the 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 video itself is so interesting, too, because the whole time I was watching it, I was trying to figure out... It took me a couple of minutes to figure out exactly what this video was. Because it's all one shot where it's him lying on a couch, just, like, looking miserable, just kind of, like, looking at the camera. But there's something... I, th I think... This is what I've figured out, I think, what it is, is that he edited a whole video and then projected it onto himself while recording himself while he's lying on the couch, you know, because it's distorted in a way that it makes me feel like it's being projected onto him. Um, but it's, like, super fascinating. Uh, and, yeah, go check check, check out his, uh, check out his stuff. I'm a top, so I don't sub to just anyone. Well, here's, that is, that is fair. Uh, but if you're going to sub to anyone, <laughs> Dan Olson. Oh, Dan's very analytical, and he used to use a puppet, but he sometimes tackles topics I'm not interested in. Yeah, I mean, even, um, that's totally fair. I will watch content that I don't even give a shit about, as long as he's talking about it, because it gives me a a perspective, I believe. Like, I'm like, what? I, I've never, I, oh god, his, um, he did a very good video on Cats, the musical, where it's just him having an existential crisis, um, and it's not him on camera. There's a little bit that's filmed in the beginning where it's him, but it's mostly just him talking over uh, footage of him driving in a car. And even though I haven't seen Cats and am angry that it exists, I, I tried to watch, I think I got like 10 minutes in the Cats and then was like, I'm good, thank you. Um, but it was it's interesting to, to hear uh, someone talk about something you know nothing about. It's I would equate it to... Um, is this sad? I don't know. I don't think so. We live in a time period where, like, I mean, right now you're watching a Twitch stream of me. You don't know me personally, but it, it kind of creates the illusion of spending time with a friend, you know? Like, you're in a room with a person who's talking. Um, 
so when I watch YouTubers, it's kind of like listening to a friend who's excited to talk about something and then they kind of go into it, you know, like, um, what was it yesterday? My friend, uh, was talking about this is us. I don't know anything about this is us, but they were talking about it and just kind of went into it. And I was like, this is cool. I feel cool. Like letting them like be excited about a thing, you know? And, uh, so that's, that's what I equate it to. But, uh, yeah. Uh, that said, I loved Dan's Suicide Squad editing video. Oh my god, it's such a good video. That's actually how I got introduced uh, to his stuff, is because I was watching another YouTuber who took um, a clip from Dan's Suicide Squad video, uh, and it was brilliant. And I was like, who is this guy? And I went and checked out his, uh, his channel. And it's very rare that I um, actually get into YouTubers, and, um, and I don't watch Twitch streamers either. But recently with this corona stuff and being stuck in the house, I've realized, hey, you know what? Part of my job uh, with Team Four Star and as a content creator myself is to kind of stay up to date with things. So maybe I should get into YouTubers. Like I should watch YouTubers do things. Uh, so I've been watching uh, musical. There's this cat, I think her name is. Uh, she does, she's into musical theater and she does like, vlogs and stuff like that about musical theater stuff uh so i'm not going in completely blind because i was a theater kid uh, but it's just enough overlay that i'm like i'm interested in this um and i've also been watching my friend's uh twitch stream recently because i'm like how does that differ what is the difference between how i stream and they they stream and all that uh <laughs> we live in a society jesse <laughs> um but, um, but yeah, so that's, that's what I've been doing recently is just watching Twitch streamers and YouTubers and stuff. Uh, I could recommend a trans streamer if you're interested. Sure. Yeah. Is that, uh, I'm going to assume you're going to talk about ContraPoints. <laughs> I'm just assuming, but it might not be. Oh, and I had turned up the mic. So I hope this isn't like super loud for you or anything. I turned it up. Because um, when I read, it's going to be around this volume. And if I'm talking regularly, it might be a little louder. So hopefully it's not terrible. Now yeah, you wrote? Okay, cool. Awesome. Mm. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, um, uh, I found Foldable Human... And Jill Birup, is that how you, yeah, uh, through that stint of time where Lindsay Ellis was uploading to uh, Chiz Apocalypse. I don't know what that is, but uh, yes, that's, that's, um, I know through, uh, we assume that like YouTubers all know each other and I'm like, no, they don't. But then I'll watch something and just, there's just different cameos and stuff. And I'm like, oh, they do know each other. Well, uh, it was, I think his 50 Shades of Grey video where, uh, Lindsay Ellis was provided a voice uh, in it and also my friend Jenny was in it too and I'm like oh everyone knows each other this is neat and honestly that's how I find people is like good people are friends with other cool people the Lexi kitty cool hey she's also on a Stardew kick yeah, my friend, um, uh, Bailey started playing Stardew Valley today, and that was a cool thing because, uh, oh, thank you. Thanks for linking it, yeah. Um, she started playing it recently, and I, you know, I p started playing it recently, so it was cool to see, uh, from another perspective, you know, like, I, usually I'm the one behind the camera, but what is it like when I am not? I tap out anything Fifty Shades related and just go back to the stuff. And Vampire Chronicles Rice wrote under the alias A.N. Rocolier. That's how I'm pronouncing that. I'm going to commit to it. Uh, yeah, yeah. If you... I usually tap out, like, anything that has to do with Fifty Shades. But if you want to check out Dan's Fifty Shades video series, there's three of them, uh, if you haven't seen them yet. 
uh i highly recommend it because he read the books and it's like it's it's very i love how honest it is because it's titled a lukewarm defense of 50 shades of gray and i'm like what are you gonna do what are you gonna say in defense of 50 shades of gray but honestly there are some good defenses of that he brings up of of the people trying to make the movie a good movie but the author is so batshit insane that she's just not letting them at every turn um it's it's an insane ride but i i recommend watching those if you if you haven't um yeah how are we doing i think we can start i usually give it a little time for people to frill in so i don't know how many of you were here for the first six chapters how many chapters was it? We're on page 57. But let's just fucking, let's just dive in. I guess what you've missed so far, seduce my ears. Let's do it. Um, so far, if I think Cucumber said it best, because uh, he was saying something along the lines of, um, Nick is kind of a piece of shit, and Amy is horned. <laughs> uh, Nick's wife, uh, Amy, has gone missing, and we switch off chapters between Nick in the present and Amy's diary entries. So that's that's a yeah. That basically says everything. Let's just dive in. <clears throat> Nick Dunn, one day gone. I didn't listen to go about the booze. I finished half the bottle sitting on her sofa by myself, my 18th burst of adrenaline kicking in just when I thought I'd finally go to sleep. My eyes were shutting. I was shifting my pillow and my eyes were closed. And then I saw my wife, blood clotting her blonde hair weeping and blind in pain, scraping herself along our kitchen floor, calling my name. Nick. Nick. Nick! I took repeated tugs on the bottle, psyching myself up for sleep, a losing routine. Sleep is like a cat. It only comes to you if you ignore it. I drank more and continued my mantra. Stop thinking, swig. Empty your head, swig. Now, seriously, empty your head. Do it now, swig. You need to be sharp tomorrow, you need to sleep. Swig. I got nothing more than a fussy nap toward dawn. Woke up an hour later with a hangover. I, uh, I can relate to that. <laughs> Not a disabling hangover, but decent. I was tender and dull. Fuggy. Maybe still a little drunk. I stutter walked to Go's sub Subaru, the movement feeling alien like my legs were on backward. I had temporary ownership of the car. The police had graciously accepted my gently used Jetta for inspection, along with my laptop. All just a formality, I was assured. I drove home to get myself some decent clothes. Three police cruisers sat on my block, our very few neighbors milling around. No Carl, but there was Jan Teverer, the Christian lady, and Mike, the father of the three-year-old IVF triplets. Trinity, Topher, and Tallulah. I hate them all just by name, said Amy, a grave judge of anything trendy. When I mentioned that the name Amy was once trendy, my wife said, Nick, you know the story of my name. I had no idea what she was talking about. Nick, I hate Nick. I'm sorry. <laughs> mm. Jan nodded from a distance without meeting my eyes, but Mike strode over to me as I got out of my car. I'm so sorry, man. Anything I can do, you let me know. Anything. Uh, I did the mowing this morning, so at least you don't need to worry about that. Mike and I took turns mowing all the abandoned, foreclosed properties in the complex. Heavy rains in the spring had turned yards into jungles, which encouraged an influx of raccoons. We had raccoons everywhere, gnawing through our garbage late at night, sneaking into our basements, lounging on our porches like lazy house pets. The mowing didn't seem to make them go away, but we could at least see them coming now. Thanks, ma'am. Thank you, I said. 
Man, my wife, she's been hysterical since she heard, he said. Absolutely hysterical. I'm so sorry to hear that, I said. I got a... I pointed at my door. Just sitting around crying over pictures of Amy. I had no doubt that a thousand internet photos had popped up overnight just to feed the pathetic needs of women like Mike's wife. I had no sympathy for drama queens. Oh my god, Nick. <laughs> Oof, I'm sorry, I hate you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you might say Amy is a gone girl. <laughs> Hey, I gotta ask, Mike started. I patted his arm and pointed again at the door, as if I had pressing business. I turned away before he could ask any questions and knocked on the door of my own house. Officer Velasquez escorted me upstairs, into my own bedroom, into my own closet, past the silvery, perfect square gift box, and let me rifle through my things. It made me tense, selecting clothes in front of this young woman with the long brown braid, this woman, who had to be judging me, forming an opinion. I ended up grabbing blindly. The final look was business casual, slacks and short sleeves, like I was going to a convention. <laughs> Sorry, I had a stupid thought. <laughs> I grabbed my uh, Hatsune Miku <laughs> cosplay, like I was going to a convention. Uh... I grabbed my Ahiego, is that how it's pronounced? <laughs> my Ahiego hoodie, because, like, I was going to a convention. He's always calling, or he's already calling her his ex wife. What a dick. <laughs> that girl gone if. Nick more like, dick, I'm big funny. <laughs> you are. Got him. Uh, let's see. It would make an interesting essay, I thought, picking out appropriate clothes when a loved one goes missing. The greedy, angle-hungry writer in me impossible to turn off. On one hand, uh, I understand, Nick. My brain works like that, too, but also you're an asshole, so that's, um... I won't give you the benefit of the doubt. I jammed it all into a bag and turned back around, looking at the gift box on the floor. Could I look inside? I asked her. She hesitated, then played it safe. Uh, no, I'm sorry, sir. Better not right now. The edge of the gift wrapping had been carefully slid. Has somebody looked inside? She nodded. I stepped around Velasquez toward the door, or er, toward the box. If it's already been looked at, then she stepped in front of me. Sir, I can't let you do that. This is ridiculous. It's for me, from my wife. I stepped back around her, bent down, and had one hand on the corner of the box when she... Hey! Madkin, thank you for the follow! Oh good, I don't even have to... <laughs> I switched the sound today, uh, so I don't have to hit the, uh, the uh, little air horn button. But thank you so much for the follow, really appreciate it. Boop, 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 boop. I stepped back around her, bent down, and had one hand on the corner of the box when she slapped an arm across my chest from behind. When she, when she slapped an arm across my chest? Oh, I see, like, grabbed him, like, around the top. I felt a momentary spurt of fury that this woman presumed to tell me what to do in my own home. No matter how hard I try to be my mother's son, my dad's voice comes into my head, unbidden, Depositing awful thoughts, nasty words. <laughs> oh, by the way, uh, Velasquez is pronounced Velasquez. The K, the Q-U-E-K, is pronounced like a K in Spanish. That makes sense. Velasquez. Thank you for telling me. I just want to memorize it. Velasquez. Velasquez. Dope. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, because, like, I, I studied Spanish for a while, but there are some things that I just don't pick up on uh, or that are just different, you know, like some, depending on what region you're from or whatever, it could be like you say things with a lisp, you know, like a Velasquez. 
which I've always been like, really? I didn't know that was a thing. Um, okay, Velasquez. <laughs> Sir, this is a crime scene, you stupid bitch. Uh, and that's supposed to be like his dad's sexist shit being instilled in him because it's an italicis. Uh, suddenly her partner, Riordan, was in the room and on me too, and I was shaking them off. Fine, fine, fuck. And they were forcing me down the stairs. I mean, yeah, Nick, you can't just interfere with crime scene shit. A woman was on all fours near the front door, squirreling along, squirreling along the floorboards, searching. I assume for blood splatter. She looked up at me impassively, then back down. I forced myself to decompress as I drove back to Goes to dress. This was only one in a long series of annoying and asinine things the police would do in the course of this investigation. I like rules that make sense, not rules without logic. So I needed to calm down. Do not antagonize the cops, I told myself. Repeat if necessary. Do not antagonize the cops. I ran into Boney as I entered the police station, and she said, Your in-laws are here, Nick in an encouraging tone, like she was offering me a warm muffin. Mary Beth and Rand Elliot were standing with their arms around each other, middle of the police station. Hey! Give one. Thank you for the follow! <laughs> I had to look at it twice, I was like... Because I'm not used to seeing the chat right here. Usually I'm uh, playing a video game and it's off to the side, and I'm like, is this the chat? Is this... What is happening? Thank you for the follow, really appreciate it. Um, let's see. Uh, War Muffin. <laughs> um, oh, cool. Yeah. That's how I always saw them. Hands patting, chins nuzzling, cheeks rubbing. Whenever I visited the alley at home, I became an obsessive throat clearer. I'm about to enter, but the Elliots would be around any corner cherishing each other. They kissed each other full in the mouth whenever they were parting, and Rand would cup his wife's rear as he passed me. It was foreign to me. My parents divorced when I was 12, and I think maybe when I was very young, I witnessed a chaste cheek kiss between the two when it was impossible to avoid. Christmas, birthdays, dry lips. On their best married days, their communications were enti entirely transactional. We're out of milk again. I'll get some today. I need this... Where is it? Oh, yeah. I need this iron properly. I'll do that today. How hard is it to buy milk? Silence. You forgot to call the plumber. Sigh. God damn it, put on your coat right now and go out and get some goddamn milk. Now. These messages and orders brought to you by my father, a mid-level phone company manager who treated my mother, at best, like an incompetent employee. At worst... He never beat her, but his pure, inarticulate fury would fill the house for days, weeks at a time, making the air humid, hard to breathe, my father stalking around with his lower jaw jutting out, giving him the look of a wounded, vengeful boxer, grinding his teeth so loud you could hear it across the room. Throwing things near her, but not exactly at her. I'm sure he told himself, I never hit her. I'm sure because of this technicality, he never saw himself as an abuser. But he turned our family life into an endless road trip with bad directions and a rage-clenched driver. A vacation that never got the chance to be fun. Don't make me turn this car around. Please, really, turn it around. I don't think my father's issue with my mother was in particular. He just didn't like women. He thought they were stupid, inconsequential, irritating. That dumb bitch. It was his favorite phrase for any woman who annoyed him. A fellow motorist, a waitress, our grade school teachers, none of whom he actually met. Parent-teacher conferences stinking of the female realm as they did. I still remember when Geraldine Ferrero was named the 1984 vice presidential candidate, us all watching in on the news before dinner. My mother, my tiny sweet mom, put her hand on the back of Go's head and said, well, I think it's wonderful. And my dad flipped the TV off and, and my dad flipped the TV off and said, It's a joke. You know it's a goddamn joke. Like watching a monkey ride a bike. 
It took another five years before my mother finally decided she was done. I came home from school one day and my father was gone. He was, there in the, he was there in the morning and gone by the afternoon. My mom sat us down at the dining table and announced, Your father and I have decided it would be best for everyone if we live apart. And Go burst into tears and said, Good, I hate you both. And then instead of running to her room like the script called for, she went to my mom and hugged her. So my father went away and my thin, pained mother got fat and happy. Fairly fat and extremely happy as if she were supposed to be that way all along, a deflated balloon taking in air. Within a year, she'd morphed into the busy, warm, cheerful lady she'd been till she died, and her sister said things like, Thank God the old Maureen is back, as if the woman who raised us was an imposter. Now, pausing for a second, I love this. Um, it, it, it shows that, like... Movie wise, we never we don't get a lot of um Nick and Go's mom, and that's a shame I feel because like I want to meet this lady. This seems great. Uh my mom has this issue where like my stepdad is a total piece of shit and um you know, just constantly trying to like She's constantly trying to make people like him, but as the time has gone on, she's just gotten more aware of the situation. And now when I've been shit talking him my whole life, but now when I shit talk him, she's like, yeah, <laughs> like she gets it. Um, and it's cool that they actually separated because he's a piece of shit. You know, usually it's just like, well, I guess we're just going to be married forever. Uh, <laughs> Let's see. As for my father, for years I spoke to him on the phone about once a month. The conversation's polite and newsy, a recital of things that happened. The only question my father ever asked about Amy was, how is Amy? Which was not meant to elicit any answer beyond, she's fine. He remained stubbornly distant even as he faded into dementia in his 60s. If you're always early, you're never late. My dad's mantra, and that included the onset of Alzheimer's. A slow decline into a sudden steep drop that forced us to move our independent, misogynistic father to a giant home that stank of chicken broth and piss, where he'd be surrounded by women helping him at all times. Ha. Huh. My dad had limitations. That's what my good-hearted mom always told us. He had limitations, but he meant no harm. It was kind of her to say, but... He did do harm. I doubt my sister will ever marry. If she's sad or upset or angry, she needs to be alone. She fears a man dismissing her womanly tears. I'm just as bad. The good stuff in me I got from my mom. I can joke, I can laugh, I can tease, I can celebrate and support and praise. I can operate in sunlight, basically. But I can't deal with angry or tearful women. I felt my father's rage rise up in me in the ugliest way. Amy could tell you about that. She could definitely tell you, if she were here. I watched Rand and Mary Beth for a moment before they saw me. I wondered how furious they'd be with me. I had committed an unforgivable act not phoning them for so long. Because of my cowardice, my in-laws would always have that night of tennis lodged in their imagination, the warm evening, the... Lazy yellow balls bumping all along the court, the squeak of tennis shoes, the average Thursday night they'd spent while their daughter was disappeared. Nick, Rand Elliott said, spotting me. He took three big strides towards me, and as I braced myself for a punch, he hugged me desperately hard. How are you holding up? He whispered into my neck and began rocking. Finally, he gave a high-pitched gulp, a swallowed sob, and gripped me by the arms. We're going to find Amy, Nick. It can't go any other way. Believe that, okay? Rand Elliott held me in his blue stare for a few more seconds, then broke up again. Three girlish gasps burst from him like hiccups, and Mary Beth moved into the huddle, buried her face in her husband's armpit. When we parted, she looked up at me with giant stunned eyes. It's just a... Just a goddamn nightmare, she said. How are you, Nick? 
When Maribeth asked, how are you, it wasn't a courtesy, it was an existential question. She studied my face, and I was sure she was studying me, and, and would continue to note my every thought and action. The Elliots believed that every trait should be considered, judged, categorized. It all means something, it can all be used. Mom, Dad, Baby, they were three advanced people with three advanced degrees in psychology. They thought more before 9 a.m. than most people thought all night, thought all month. I remember once declining cherry pie at dinner, and Rand crooked his head at me and said, Ah, I can... <laughs> oh, what is this word? Iconic iconoclast. Ah, iconoclast disdains the easy symbolic patriotism. And when I tried to laugh it off and said, Well, I, I didn't like cherry cobbler. I didn't like cherry cobbler either. Oh, wait, what is this? Oh, cherry pie. Okay. <laughs> he declined cherry pie, and now he's talking about cobbler. Um, I didn't like cherry cobbler either. Mary Beth touched Rand's arm. Because of the divorce, all those comfort foods, the desserts a family eats together, those are just bad memories for Nick. It was silly, but incredibly sweet. These people spending so much energy trying to figure me out. The answer? I don't like cherries. Apparently, Pabst Blue Ribbon makes coffee now. No shit. Well, <laughs> hard coffee. Hell yeah. Let's fucking get lit at 9 a.m. <laughs> By 11.30, the station was a rolling... It is rolling. Okay. By 11.30, the station was a rolling boil of noise. Phones were ringing. People were yelling across the room. A woman whose name I never caught, whom I registered only as a chattering bobblehead of hair, suddenly made her presence known at my side. I had no idea how long she'd been there. And the point of this, Nick, is just to get people looking for Amy and knowing she has a family who loves her and wants her back. This will all be very controlled. Nick, you'll need to... Nick? Yep. People will want to hear a quick statement from her husband. From across the room, Go was darting towards me. She dropped me at the station, then run by the bar to take care of bar things for 30 minutes. And now she was back, acting like she'd abandoned me for a week, zigzagging between desks, ignoring the young officer who'd clearly been assigned to usher her in, neatly, in a hushed, dignified manner. Okay so far? Go said, squeezing me with one arm. The dude hug. The Dunn kids didn't perform hugs well. Go's thumb landed on my right nipple. I wish Mom was here, she whispered, which was what I'd been thinking. No news? She asked when she pulled away. Nothing. Fucking nothing. You look awful. You, you look like you feel awful. I feel like fucking shit. I was about to say what an idiot I was, not listening to her about the booze. I would have finished the bottle, too. She patted my back. It's almost time, the PR woman said, again appearing magically. It's not a bad turnout for a July 4th weekend. She started herding us all toward a dismal conference room, aluminum blinds and folding chairs and a clutch of bored reporters, and up onto the platform. I felt like a third-tier speaker at a mediocre convention. <laughs> See, he should have got his Ahiego fucking shirt <laughs> for the convention. Uh, me, and my, me and my business casual blues addressing a captive audience of jet-lagged people daydreaming about what they'd had for lunch. But I could see the journalists perk up when they caught sight of me. Let's say it. A young, decent-looking guy, and then the PR woman placed a cardboard poster on a nearby easel, and it was a blown-up photo of Amy at her most stunning, the face that made you keep double-checking. She can't be that good-looking, can she? She could. She was and I stared at the photo of my wife as the camera snapped photos of me staring at the photo. I thought of that day in New York when I found her again. The blonde hair, the back of her head, was all I could see, but I, I knew it was her, and I saw it as a sign. How many millions of heads had I seen in my life, but I knew this was Amy's pretty skull floating down 7th Avenue in front of me. I knew it was her, and that we could be together. Yeah, Nick, shut the fuck up. You ghosted her. Uh, <laughs> which is not in the movie. It's in the book. You can go fuck yourself.
Is that a fly? No, it was a feather. Okay. I was gonna say, I haven't, like, opened my door in fucking forever. How could a fly get in here? <sighs> Cameras flashed. I turned away and saw spots. It was surreal. That's what people always say to describe moments that are merely unusual. I thought, you have no fucking idea what surreal is. My hangover was really warming up now, my left eye throbbing like a heart. The cameras were clicking, and the two families stood together, all of us with mouths and thin slits, go the only one looking even close to a real person. The rest of us looked like placeholder humans. Bodies that had been dollied in and propped up. Amy, over on her easel, looked more present. We'd all seen these news conferences before, when other women went missing. We were being forced to perform the scene that TV viewers expected. The worried but hopeful family. Caffeine-dazed eyes and ragdoll arms. My name was being said. The room gave a collective gulp of expectation. Showtime. When I saw the broadcast later, I didn't recognize my voice. I barely recognized my face. The booze floating, sludge-like, just beneath the surface of my skin made me look like a fleshy wastrel just sensuous enough to be disruptible. I had worried about my voice wavering, so I overcorrected and the words came out clipped like I was reading a stock report. We just want Amy to get home safe. Utterly unconvincing. Disconnected. I might as well have been reading numbers at random. Rand Elliott stepped up and tried to save me. Our daughter, Amy, is a sweetheart of a girl, full of life. She's our only child and she's smart and beautiful and kind. She really is amazing, Amy, and we want her back. Nick wants her back. He put a hand on my shoulder, wiped his eyes, and I involuntarily turned to steel. My father again. Men don't cry. Rand kept talking. We all want her back where she belongs, with her family. We've set up a command center over at the Days Inn. The news reports would show Nick Dunn, husband of the missing woman, standing metallically next to his father-in-law, arms crossed, eyes glazed, looking almost bored as Amy's parents wept. And then worse, my longtime response, the need to remind people I wasn't a dick, I was a nice guy, despite the eff the aff effect was, yeah. My long-time response, the need to remind people I wasn't a dick, I was a nice guy, despite the effectless stare, the haughty douchebag face. So there it came, out of nowhere, as Rand begged for his daughter's return. A killer smile. Ooh. Nick, you fucked up. Okay, I get it, because I smile when I'm nervous, but fuck Nick. And it's really interesting because, like, you got to read a lot more into it in the movie version because, um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that they kept in the dad so you could see, uh, he's also muttering bitch and stuff like that in, in the, uh, in the movie so you can, uh, infer, like, why Nick is sexist. But it's not as clear cut because you don't hear his inner dialogue, you know, like in the movie. I'm going to have to rewatch it an eighth or nine times, whatever the fuck I'm on right now. But um, Nick is not as blatantly hateable, I guess, in the movie. Um, but yeah, you can. I, I like how the book goes into like it's affected Go and it's affected Nick. Both of them are um, sexist and not super into, like, affection, you know, and they get into that more in the book, which I appreciate. <clears throat> Amy Elliott Dunn, July 5th, 2010. Diary entry. I won't blame Nick. I don't blame Nick. I refuse, refuse to turn into some pert-mouthed, strident, angry girl. I made two promises to myself when I married Nick. One, no dancing monkey demands. Two, I would never, 
ever say, sure, that's fine by me. If you want to stay out later, if you want to do a boys weekend, if you want to do something you want to do, and then punish him for doing what I said was fine by me. I worry I am coming perilously close to violating both of those promises. But still, it is our third wedding anniversary and I am alone in our apartment, my face all masked tight from tears because, well, because just this afternoon I get a voicemail from Nick and I already know it's going to be bad. I know the second the voicemail begins because I can tell he's calling from his cell and I can hear men's voices in the background and a big roomy gap like he's trying to decide what to say. And then I hear his taxi blurred voice voice that is already wet and lazy with booze and I know I am going to be angry. That quick inhale, the lips going tight, the shoulders up, the I so don't want to be mad but I'm going to be feeling. Do men not know that feeling? You don't want to be mad but you're obligated to be almost because a rule, a good rule, a nice rule is being broken. Or maybe rule is the wrong word? Protocol? Nicety? But the rule slash protocol slash nicety, our anniversary, is being broken for a good reason. I understand. I do. The rumors were true. 16 writers have been laid off at Nick's magazine. A third of the staff. Nick has been spared for now. But of course he feels obligated to take the others out to get drunk. They are men piled in a cab heading down 2nd Avenue pretending to be brave. A few have gone home to their wives, but a surprising number have stayed out. Nick will spend the night of our anniversary buying these men drinks, going to strip clubs and cheesy bars, flirting with 22-year-olds. 22, 22 My friend here just got laid off. He could use a hug. These jobless men will proclaim Nick a great guy as he buys their drinks on a credit card linked to my bank account. Nick will have a grand old time on our anniversary, which he didn't even mention in the message. Instead, he said, I know we had plans, but... I am being a girl. I just thought it'd be a tradition. All across town, I have strewn little love messages, reminders of our past year together, my treasure hunt. I can picture the third clue fluttering from a piece of scotch tape in the crook of the V of the Robert Indiana love sculpture up near Central Park. Tomorrow, some bored 12-year-old tourist stumbling along behind his parents is going to pick it up, read it, shrug, and let it float away like a gum wrapper. My treasure hunt finale was perfect, but isn't now. It's an absolutely gorgeous vintage briefcase. Leather. Third anniversary is leather. A work-related gift may be a bad idea, given that work isn't exactly happy right now. In our kitchen, I have two live lobsters, like always, or like what was supposed to be always. I need to phone my mom and see if they can keep for a day scrambling dazedly around their crate, or if I need to stumble in and with my wine-lame eyes battle them and boil them in my pot for no good reason. I'm killing two lobsters I won't even eat. Dad phoned to wish us happy anniversary and I picked up the phone, and I was going to play it cool, but then I started crying when I started talking. I was doing the awful chick talk cry. And so, so I had to tell him what happened, and he told me I should open a bottle of wine and wallow in it for a bit. Dad is always a proponent of a good indulgent sulk. See, that's cool. Like, you see the differences between... um. Amy's dad and Nick's dad is like, you know, like, it's so interesting and cool. Because Amy's dad, she's like, why, like, you know, crying to him, like, hey, this sucks. It's like, my husband ditched me on our anniversary. And he's like, honey, open a bottle of wine. <laughs> like, he's like, what good masculinity? Like, what positive fucking masculinity? And then you go to Nick's dad, and he's just like the, the definition of toxic masculinity. Shit, man, Amy sounds great. 10 out of 10 would hold hands with. Yeah, no, Amy's great. <laughs> I do more than hand-holding. Amy horns. <laughs> yeah, Amy gets... Uh, it's so funny, because, like, in the movie, they do, like, go into Amy being real horns, um, but not to the degree of the book. 
I think uh, in Amy's diary entries in the movie, I think they only have sex like once or twice. But book Amy is like, woof. Um, no, Amy, Amy's dope. Let's see. I'm going to drink some water real quick, actually. If you're reading, you got to make sure you hydrate. More like hydrate. <clears throat> Still, Nick will be angry that I told Rand, and of course Rand will do his fatherly thing, pat Nick on the shoulder and say, Heard you had some energy drinking. Oh, heard, uh, sorry. Heard you had some emergency drinking you had to do on your anniversary, Nikki. And chuckle. So Nick will know and he will be angry with me because he wants my parents to believe he's perfect. He beams when I tell them stories about what a flawless son-in-law he is. Except for tonight. I know, I know I'm being a girl. Yeah, Nick, maybe if you want them to be perfect, you could be perfect. Like, just... Maybe just not be a shithead, and then people won't know you're a shithead. What's further than hand-holding? That's the peak of degeneracy. <laughs> yeah, I got no idea what comes after hand-holding. That's the, that's the, um, that's pretty adult, actually. Inappropriate. Can we, uh, save the potty talk? <laughs> it's 5 a.m. The sun is coming up, almost as bright as the street lights outside that have just blinked off. I always like that switch when I'm awake for it. Sometimes when I can't sleep, I'll pull myself out of bed and walk through the streets at dawn. And when the lights click off all together, I always feel like I've seen something special. Oh, there go the street lights, I want to announce. In New York, it's not 3 or 4 a.m. That's the quiet time. There are too many bar stragglers calling out to each other as they collapse in the taxis yelping into their cell phones as they frantically smoke that one last cigarette before bed. 5 a.m., that's the best time, when the clicking of your heels on the sidewalk sounds illicit. All the people have been put away in their boxes, and you have the whole place to yourself. Side note, I agree with that. I lived in Brooklyn, love that time, when there's just no one on the street. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot to mention hand-holding breaches terms of service. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Excuse me. Thank you. He keeps trying to hide how much of a piece of shit he is instead of trying to do anything about it. Yeah, that's like... <sighs> oof. It's not even. Like, like I was going to compare him to Bojack, but like Bojack at least tries to be a better person. Bojack has the thing, at least in the last season, where he realizes he's a piece of shit and he tries to fix himself. And then it's not working right away, and then he gets frustrated and is like, well, I'm a better person now, so, like, damn it, you should, you know. But Nick doesn't even, like, he's just not even taking that step. He's just, like, does a bunch of bad shit, and then is, like, and then when someone calls him out on it, he's like, hey, that's mean. I, I don't like how you're calling me out on my shit. Here's what happened. Nick got home just after four, a bulb of beer and cigarettes and fried egg odor attached to him, a placenta of stink. I was still awake, waiting for him, my brain thunking after a marathon of law and order. He sat down on our ottoman and I gla he sat down on our ottoman and glanced at the present on the table and said nothing. I stared at him back. He clearly, he clearly wasn't going to even graze against an apology. Hey, sorry things got screwy today. That's all I wanted, just a, a quick acknowledgement. Happy day after anniversary, I start. He sighs, a deep, aggrieved moan. Amy, I've had the crappiest day ever. Please don't lay a guilt trip on me on top of it. I'm so I'm so mad at Nick right now. Jesus Christ. Oh. oh. <sighs> Nick grew up with a father who never ever apologized. So when Nick feels he's screwed up, he goes on offense. I know this, and I can usually wait it out. Usually. I was just saying happy anniversary. 
Happy anniversary, my asshole husband who neglected me on my big day. We sit silent for a minute, my stomach nodding. I don't want to be the bad guy here. I don't deserve that. Nick stands up. Well, how was it? I ask Dolly. How was it? It was fucking awful. Sixteen of my friends now have no jobs. It was miserable. I'll probably be gone too, another two months. <laughs> friends. He doesn't even like half the guys he was out with, but I say nothing. Yeah, that's the good difference. Bojack knows he's a terrible person, but Nick doesn't think he is. That's the issue. He's He just thinks it's everyone else's fault. I know it feels dire right now, Nick, but... It's not dire for you, Amy. Not for you, it never will be dire. But for the rest of us, it's very different. The same old. Nick resents that I've never had to worry about money, and I never will. He thinks that makes me softer than everyone else, and I wouldn't disagree with him. But I do work. I clock in and clock back out. Some of my, some of my girlfriends have literally never had a job. They discuss people with jobs in the pitying tones you talk about a fat girl with such a nice face. They will lean forward and say, but of course, Ellen has to work. Oh, I see. Mm. Uh, I'm going to take that read different. They will lean forward and say, but of course, Ellen has to work. Like something out of a Noel Coward play. They don't count me because I can always quit my job if I want to. I could build my days around cherry committees and home decoration and gardening and volunteering, and I don't think there's anything wrong with building a life around those things. Most beautiful good things are done by women who people scorn. But I work. Nick, I I'm on your side here. We'll be okay no matter what. My money is your money. Not according to the prenup. He is drunk. He only mentions the prenup when he's drunk. And all the resentment comes back. I've told him hundreds, literally hundreds of times. I've said the words, the prenup is pure business. It's not for me. It's not even for my parents. It's for my parents' lawyers. It has, it says nothing about us, not you and me. He walks over toward the kitchen, tosses his wallet and wilted dollars on the coffee table, crumples a piece of newspaper, crumples a piece of notepaper and tosses it in the trash with a series of credit card receipts. That's a shitty thing to say, Nick. It's a shitty way to feel, Amy. He walks to our bar in the careful swamp waiting gait of a drunk and actually pours himself another drink. You're going to make yourself sick, I say. He raises his glass and an up yours cheers to me. You just don't get it, Amy. You just can't. I've worked since I was 14 years old. I didn't get to go to fucking tennis camp and creative writing camp, and SAT prep, and all that shit that apparently everyone else in New York City did, because I was wiping down tables at the mall, and I was mowing lawns, and I was driving to Hannibal, and fucking dressing like Huck Finn for the tourists, and I was cleaning the funnel cake skillets at night. I feel an urge to laugh, actually to guffaw. A big belly laugh that would sweep up Nick, and soon we'd both be laughing, and this would be over. This litany of crummy jobs. Being married to Nick always reminds me, people have to do awful things for money. Ever since I've been married to Nick, I always wave to people dressed as food. I've had to work so much harder... Wait, I want to check who this is. Okay, it's Nick. <laughs> I've had to work so much harder than anyone else at the magazine to even get to the magazine. 20 years, basically, I've been working to get where I am, and now it's all going to be gone, and there's not a fucking thing I know how to do instead, unless I want to go back home, be a river rat again. You're probably too old to play Huck Finn, I say. Fuck you, Amy. And then he goes to the bedroom. He's never said that to me before, but it came out of his mouth so smoothly that I assume, and this never crossed my mind, I assume he's thought it. Many times. I never thought I'd be the kind of woman who'd be told to fuck herself by her husband. And we've sworn never to go to bed angry. Compromise, communicate, and never go to bed angry. The three pieces of advice gifted and re-gifted to all newlyweds. 
But lately it seems that I'm the only one who compromises. Our communications don't solve anything. And Nick is very good at going to bed angry. He can turn off his emotions like a spout. He's already snoring. And then I can't help myself, even though it's none of my business, even though Nick would be furious if he knew. I cross over to the trash can and pull out the receipts so I can picture where he's been all night. Two bars, two strip clubs. And I can see him in each one, talking about me with his friends, because he must have already talked about me for all that petty, smeared meanness to come out so easily. I picture them at one of the pricier strip clubs, the posh ones that make men believe they are still designed to rule, that women are meant to serve them, the deliberately bad acoustics and thwumping music so no one has to talk, a stretch, a stretch titted woman straddling my husband, who swears it's all in fun, her hair trailing down her back, her lips wet with gloss, but I'm not supposed to be threatened. No, it's just boyish hijinks. I am supposed to laugh about it. I am supposed to be a good sport. Then I unroll the crumpled piece of notebook paper and see a girl's handwriting, Hannah, and a phone number. I wish it were like the movies, the name something silly, Candy or Bambi. Something you could roll your eyes at. Misty with two hearts over the eyes. But it's Hannah, who is a real woman, presumably like me. Nick has never cheated on me, he's sworn it, but... I also know he has ample opportunity. I could ask him about Hannah, and he'd say, I have no idea why she gave me her number, but I didn't want to be rude, so I took it. Which may be true. Or not. He could cheat on me, and he would never tell me, and he would think less and less of me for not figuring it out. Yeah, that was weird. Something fell behind me. It was bread. I thought it was Khaleesi for a second, but Khaleesi's staring at it too. Yeah. Big yawn. <laughs> He's so unbearably condescending. Nick is a very good example of toxic masculinity. Oh, yes, absolutely. Funnel cakes aren't made in skillets. They're poured through a funnel into boiling oil. Yeah, I don't know. Like, <laughs> I don't know if that's him being drunk or like... Lizzie. Are you a little baby? Yeah. Oh, who's a good baby? Yeah, it's you. Good, her butthole is just right off screen. You want me to read to you? Oh, hold on. Just got something in my eye. Good girl. Who's a good baby? Thank you. She's very good for letting me touch her eye. Yes, you are. Some cats, you know. I tried to, you know, uh, since I, I got her when she was like 10 months old, I think. Um, and I wanted to train her to make sure like she lets me touch her around her eyes if, if uh, I need to. Um, and luckily she's smart enough that it took, even though I started teaching her when she was almost a year old. You are so smart. You have a fuzzy little face, and it's ridiculous. Good puss puss. If you're a good puss puss. She's, she's nice. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> he would see me across the breakfast table, innocently slurping cereal, and know that I am a fool, and how could anyone respect a fool? Now I'm crying again, with Hannah in my hand. It's a very female thing, isn't it, to take one boy's night and snowball it into a marital infidelity that will destroy our marriage? I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I'm feeling like a shrill fishwife or a foolish doormat. I don't, I don't know which. I don't want to be angry. I can't even figure out if I should be angry. I consider checking into a hotel. Let him wonder about me for a change. I stay where I am for a few minutes. And then I take a breath and wade into our bo booze humid bedroom. And when I get in bed, he turns to me and wraps his arms around me and buries his face in my neck. And at the same time, we both say, 
I'm sorry. Ooh, that is such a chilling end to that, um, that chapter. I absolutely love that end to it because that is just it. Like, a, a toxic, abusive piece of shit can just be, like, super horrible to you for a whole night and you're in the right and then you end up apologizing like at the same time that he does and it's like well i guess we were both in the wrong <laughs> you know like oof i feel i felt that in my soul kill him in his drunken slumber amy that'll show him to make a fool of you <laughs> nick done one day gone flash bulbs exploded and i dropped the smile but not soon enough I felt a wave of heat roll up my neck, and beads of sweat broke out of my nose. Ugh, stupid, Nick, stupid. And then, just as I was pulling myself together, the press conference was over, and it was too late to make any other impression. I walked out with the Elliots, my head ducked low as more flash bulbs popped. It was exactly... I was almost to the exit when Gilpin trotted across the room toward me, flagging me down. Gonna grab a minute, Nick? He updated me as we headed toward a back office. We checked out that house in your uh, neighborhood that was broken into. Looks like people camped out there, so we got lab. Um, oh, hey. I thought it was a typo, but he does say there twice. Let me Let me repeat that. We checked out that house in your neighborhood that was broken into. Looks like people camped out there, so we've got a lab there. And we found another house on the edge of your complex. Had some squatters. I mean, that's what worries me, I said. Guys are camped out everywhere. This whole town is overrun with pissed off, unemployed people. Carthage was, until a year ago, a company town. And that company was the sprawling Riverway Mall. A tiny city unto itself that once employed 4,000 locals, one-fifth the population. It was built in 1985, a destination mall meant to attract shoppers from all over the Middle West. I still remember the opening day. Me and Go, Mom and Dad, watching the festivities from the very back of the crowd in the vast, tarred parking lot. Because our father, Because our father always wanted to be able to leave quickly from anywhere. Even at baseball games, we parked by the exit and left at the eighth inning. <laughs> me and Go, a protect, uh, me and Go, a predictable set of mustard-smeared wines, petulant and sun-fevered. We never get to see the end. But this time, our faraway vantage was desirable because we got to take in the full scope of the event: the impatient crowd leaning collectively from one foot to another. The mayor atop a red, white, and blue daze. The blooming words, pride, growth, prosperity, success, rolling over us. Soldiers on the battlefields of consumerism, armed with vinyl-covered checkbooks and quilted handbags. And the doors opening. And the rush into the air conditioning. The music. And I say that as music, M-U-Z-A-K. <laughs> the smiling salespeople who were our neighbors. My father actually let us go inside that day, actually waited in line and bought us something that day. Sweaty paper cups brimming with orange Julius. Oh, I see. Pride. <laughs> Cucumber did a bunch of uh, pride gifts. Not gifts, emotes. I sound old. I guess not even an old person would call them gifts. Pictures. Um, one of those moving pictures. For a quarter century, the Riverway Mall was a given. Then the recession hit, washed away the Riverway store by store until the whole mall finally went bust. It is now two million square feet of echo. No, com no company came to claim it. No businessman promised a resurrection. No one knew what to do with it, or what would become of all the people who'd worked there. Including my mother, who lost her job at Shoeby Dooby. Ooh, that's so good. Shoe, it's like S-H-O-E. Shoeby Dooby. Two decades of kneeling and kneading, of sorting boxes and collecting moist foot hosiery. Gone without ceremony. The downfall of the mall basically bankrupt Carthage. People lost their jobs. 
They lost their houses. No one could see anything good coming anytime soon. We never get to see the end. Except it looked like this time Go and I would. We all would. This is dope. Um, I'm going to make another pot of coffee if that's all right with y'all. So if you want to just give me a second, I'm going to put that on. Because I my sleep schedule has been so weird lately. Like, I'm not, I'm not supposed to be tired. But I am, but I'm not. You know what I mean? So I'm just going to do that real quick. You're back. I've also learned how easy it is to make coffee. That would be a whole dooby doo, shooby doo, shooby shooby doo doo. But uh, it ain't. There are moments from the movie that I can't wait to like get to in the book. Uh. I don't know if you heard her weird little meow just now, but it was very good. She does this weird thing where she goes <laughs> nah, She's such a weird little cat Coffee's the only thing keeping me together in self-isolation so I feel it, yeah <laughs> Yeah, the um What's it called? Uh, Mr. Coffee? Mr. Coffee is um, very easy to use. Honestly, the only sustainable jobs in the Midwest are agriculture, trains, barges, and factories. Yeah, I have never, I think the only place in the South I've been to, Florida isn't the South, technically. It's South, but it's not like the South. I've been to Florida. <laughs> uh, I've been to Texas. I'm moving there. Um, and I've been to Georgia because of Dragon Con. But I haven't really experienced the South, you know? but I'm also queer, so I might have a bad time. <laughs> but I'm moving to Texas, so. I'm going to a Twitch page real quick. Let's see if it... Good, I muted it in time. Yeah, it's interesting, because I've been trying to get a a read on how many people are like in the audience right now. Because Streamlabs says five people are watching. But then the users that are actually here... It says like ten people. <laughs> so I don't know what the accurate it is. Florida is its own entity. La <laughs> yeah, yeah, Florida is just Florida. Florida is um, its own country. <laughs> The only reason to come to the Midwest is cheaper pork, Bud Light, and corn. <laughs> I like corn. I like por porn. Yep. <laughs> uh, porn. It's a combination of pork and corn. Mmm. Love porn. Delicious. Texas isn't as bad as other places in the South for queer people. Yeah. Good. Like, I've... I've we've talked about it, but uh, the uh, near cities, I've heard that it's better, which is dope. 
Because I'm moving to Dallas. Khaleesi doesn't know what to make of the coffee machine. So she'll like walk past it and like give it a side eye and then just keep walking. I tweeted about it, but the other day I was making coffee. It was like one of the first times that I made coffee in that thing. And she jumped up like onto this. It's just sitting on this like little ledgy thing. It's not even a full table. And it's like just there's not a lot of room to stand. And she jumped up next to it and was just like like this close to the coffee thing. Just like just like just looking at it. And she's just gonna like put her nose against it. And I'm like, hey, fucking don't. Can we not, Khaleesi? Can we just not, please? Uh, she's very upset at me because clearly I'm an asshole. I'm the bad guy. Ah, if people mute the stream, it doesn't count them as a viewer. So people are probably lurking hard mode. Ooh, I see you lurking. Hey, it's me. You can't hear what I'm saying, but I'm trying to get your attention. <laughs> it's almost done. This is this coffee tastes more like Dunkin' Donuts because uh, I used to work at Dunkin' Donuts and I tried getting into coffee when I was. Um, you know, when I was there, and uh, I would try to taste it. I'd fill it full of, like, sugar and milk. And Maxwell House didn't taste like that. But now having this fruity-flavored cereal coffee it does taste like that. It's done. Uh-huh. Let's do it. Let's fucking go. The one thing I have to remember to do is to actually turn off the machine. Still thinking about Shooby Doo. What a good name. The only thing I knew about Mr. Coffee before I started actually making coffee was uh, the lyrics from. Whatever it is, that's like, please turn me on, I'm Mr. Coffee with an automatic drip. Buddy, I can sing all the lyrics of that song, but I don't actually know the name of the song. And it's like, sweat, baby, sweat, baby, sex is a Texas drought. No. I do not know the name. I assume it's just called the sex song. I feel like it's something like that. And I'll go over to the chat and people will be like, that's blank song. And I will believe you. Aha. Sorry, I'm weird. I make my own sound effects. Yeah, bitch. See, now I have to drink enough out of it that, like, I can transport it places without it spilling everywhere. But it's hot. The bad touch. Yes, that's what it is. I knew it was something. It was like, <laughs> what did I guess? The sex song. <laughs> I love the half coffee, half hot chocolate at Dunkin'. Ooh, yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah, we have a, um, from what I remember, we have a setting on the machine that does that. So like, you have one button that's hot chocolate and then one button that's like half and half. But it's been a while. It's been a while. 
Who is that? Who sings that song? Daughtry? That would be my guess. Let me, uh... It's been, uh... It's been a while since you looked at me. Oh, is it stained? Yeah, it's stained. <laughs> Oh my god, I just looked up the lyrics and they're insane. Oh, to the bad touch? Yeah. It's um It's one of those cases of just going off. Just like they probably just were like, this sounds good, and just kept writing and writing and were on some kind of drug and then they finished the song and was like, cool, let's record it. I wonder if I <clears throat> do I know all the lyrics? I haven't, I've never done it at karaoke, but it's been like maybe eight years. Okay, let's do it. Let me see. Sweat, baby, sweat, baby. Sex is a Texas drop me and you do the kind of stuff that only Prince would sing about. So put your hands down my pants and I bet you'll feel nuts. Yes, I'm Cisco. Yes, I'm Ebert. And you're getting two thumbs up. What is this? Oh yep, that is it. That is the the music video is fucking buck wild. I remember just peak nineties. Like what year even was this? It was probably two thousand, but it feels nineties to me. Oh my god! No, the first comment uh, that's like the highest up is from a, a week ago, and it says "Innocent Times" when songs about sex were funny and Corona was a weird Mexican beer. <laughs> remember? Back in the days. Yeah, I don't think I... <laughs> if I was doing headphones, I would for sure find an instrumental and just like sing along to it. But I think you would hear it twice because I'd have to have that loud enough for me to... Let's see. Sweat, baby, sweat, baby. Sex is a Texas drop me and you do the kind of stuff that only Prince would sing about. So put your hands down my pants and I bet you'll feel nuts. Yes, I'm Cisco. Yes, I'm Ebert. And you're getting two thumbs up. You've had enough of two hand touch. You want it rough. You're out of bounds. I want you smothered. Want you covered like my waffle house hash browns. Got me quicker than FedEx. Got to reach an apex just like Coca-Cola stock. You are inclined to make me rise an hour early just like daylight savings time. Do it now. And then it goes into the chorus. Uh, love. The kind something something love the kind you clean up with a mop and bucket like the last catacombs of egypt only god knows where we stuck it hieroglyphics let me be specific i want to be down in your south seas but i got this motion that the oh no i've got this mo notion that the motion of your ocean means small craft advisory so if i capsize on your thighs high tide b5 you sunk my battleship please turn me on i'm mr coffee with an automatic drip so show me yours i'll show you mine tool time you'll love it just like lyle and then we'll do it doggy style so we can both watch x files do it now that's like it sounds very pleasing to say so at least there's that oh Holy shit. <laughs> it is so fucking weird to know the lyrics of a song that you just haven't heard in like eight to ten years. You know? I know that. Why do I know that? Guess guess sixteen year old Jesse just felt like memorizing a weird fucking song. Can you just read the lyrics like you're reading a book? <laughs> Love, the kind you clean up with a mop and bucket. <laughs> I just do like a, it's like, uh, oh, who was it? Um, was it Shatner who did a weird Rocket Man performance where there was like, he interprets? No, it wasn't Rock. It was it Rocket Man. It was Rocket Man. He he did like a weird performance where he interprets the song, and it comes out as like a dramatic reading. And then you're like, okay, I know what's happening. What you know, cool, whatever. But then like he starts going into it, and then all of a sudden there's another Shatner beside him, and you're like, this is a live performance. What is happening? And then there's three of them. They're all doing shit. 
my friend showed it to me the other day um and it's it was it's a fucking trip it's wild uh, <laughs> we were just exchanging youtube videos they showed me that and i showed them uh michael gormley i don't think i've shown y'all michael gormley if you go you don't have to watch it now because it is an experience but if I search Michael Gormley, let's see if it comes up. Oh, okay. You go to YouTube, you search Michael Gormley. He has a song called Without You that is ah, chef's kiss, delicious. Just, uh, just, oh, it's by the Uncharted Zone, which is like this collection of like karaoke songs. Not even karaoke songs. It just seems like it's karaoke because because uh, of the music videos. And uh, I want Michael Gormley to be my dad. He's a fucking trip. But check that out later, please. I'm just trying to get enough coffee in me that I can, like, exist. Because the longer I take to drink this, the longer it'll be in my system, you know? So I just gotta chug it. Ah, but it's hot. Yeah, I like this coffee. I like it. It's the cereal milk one. Mm. Not, not bad. But of course when you want to chug something, you can't. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, they talk about the mall quite a bit in here, and I think in the movie they have um they have a scene where they actually go in the mall. I wonder if that's like in here or if they just talked so little about the mall that they were like, well, let's set the the scene in the mall so we have a little mention of it. We'll find out together, I suppose. The bankruptcy matched my psyche perfectly. For several years, I had been bored. Not a whining, restless child's boredom, although I was not above that, but a dense, blanketing malice. It seemed to me that there was nothing new to be discovered ever again. Our society was utterly, ruinously derivative. Although the word derivative is a criticism, is... Oh, I see. Although the word derivative as a criticism is itself derivative. We were the first human beings who would never see anything for the first time. We stare at the wonders of the world, dull-eyed, underwhelmed. Mona Lisa, the pyramids, the Empire State Building, jungle animals on attack, ancient icebergs collapsing, volcanoes erupting. I can't recall a single amazing thing I have seen firsthand that I didn't immediately reference to a movie or TV show. A fucking commercial. You know the awful sing-song of the blasé? Seen it. I've literally seen it all. And the worst thing, the thing that makes me want to blow my brains out, is the secondhand experience is always better. The image is crisper. The view is keener. The camera angle and the soundtrack manipulate my emotions in a way reality can't anymore. I don't know that we are actually human at this point, those of us who are like most of us, who grew up with TV and movies and now the internet. If we're betrayed, we know the words to say. When a loved one dies, we know the words to say. If we want to play the stud or the smartass or the fool, we know the words to say. We're all working from the same dog-eared script. It's a very difficult era in which to be a person, just a real actual person instead of a collection of personality traits selected from an endless automat of characters. And if all of us are play acting, there can be no such thing as a soulmate because we don't have genuine souls. It had gotten to the point where it seemed like nothing matters because I'm not a real person and neither is anyone else. I would have done anything to feel real again. That's really interesting. Like, I feel that because, um, 
if you were to take me to a sports anything, I would much rather see it filmed at home, I guess, because when you're at a wrestling event and you're in the audience, you only get one angle. And I guess I've been raised like most of what Nick said is bullshit, but I like that. That actually makes sense. Cause, cause it's, he says that it's, uh, let me see. He said something about crisp images. That was the image is crisper. The view is keener. The camera angle and the soundtrack manipulate my emotions in a way reality can't anymore. Yeah, no, that's, um, that's legit. I feel that. That's a, that's very interesting. You get one singular point, Nick. And that's it. Go back to your fucking boomer talk now. Oh. <clears throat> Gilpin opened the door to the same room where they'd questioned me the night before. In the center of the table sat Amy's silvery gift box. I stood staring at the box sitting in the middle of the table, so ominous in this new setting. A sense of dread descended on me. Why hadn't I found it before? I should have found it. Go ahead, Gilpin said. We wanted you to take a look at this. Yeah, I think before I accidentally forgot Gilpin's accent, I'm adding it back. Here we go. <laughs> I opened it as gingerly as if a head might be found. Um, oh, okay. I opened it as gingerly as if a head might be inside. I found only a creamy blue envelope marked first clue. Gilpin smirked. Image, imagine our confusion. A missing person's case, and here we find an envelope marked first clue. Okay, I like what the movie did, because the movie gave that line to Boney. Um, but it's a good line. It's funny, you know. Imagine our confusion, a missing person's case, and here we find an envelope marked first clue. And, uh, you know, Nick has just had this monologue about how we've seen everything, and we'd much rather be seeing things from a screen. And this is... This is uh, or rather, maybe I'm projecting that. Because I like seeing things from a screen. But uh, Nick is complaining about being bored. Ah, sorry, just trying to get coffee in me. Because ah, coffee kind of hits me the same as alcohol. Where I don't like the taste of it. But I'm trying to get it in my body to feel an effect. And right now, I just got a burst of energy from the coffee. So I'm like, good, got to keep going. Uh, that's what alcohol does also, where I feel the burst. And then I'm like, cool, keep it going. And then I'll drink a bunch, you know. Oh. Is that good a a ASMR for y'all? Because um, I'm realizing now, maybe I shouldn't be slurping in front of the mic. Um, yeah, hopefully it's all right. Maybe that's the fun of it. Maybe you, you like it. <laughs> Imagine if it was meant to be a romantic treasure hunt in which he's supposed to find her and he's too much of a shit to realize and now she's in a box somewhere starving, waiting. <laughs> yeah, Amy is just like waiting on a boat or like <laughs> now he'll have to find us for the five year anniversary or he'll, he'll have to find me. He'll have to solve the, the riddle or I will perish. Slurp for me, bro. Oh, hell yeah. It's just bros being bros, you know. Oh, hi, Khaleesi. Hello, little cat. It's funny, involuntarily, sometimes I'll see her and go, hello, little space cat. And I've, I was thinking, like, what is that from? Why do I keep saying that? It's from my Star Wars videos. It's from the Kylo Ren uh, series. And... I'm not one to quote my own stuff, but it's cute. I like that name for Khaleesi. <laughs> Hello, little space cat. You're not going to chew that wire, are you? That wouldn't be very good. It's okay if you say no bromo. I ain't saying shit, though. Hell yeah. 
It's all the bromo here, okay? Everything. You're gay just being in this chat, sorry to say. Yes, bromo. <laughs> oh, hello. Oh, your your tail is right in front of the camera. <laughs> Hi. Sweetie, I'm busy. Your butt is right in my face. You're hitting the... Khaleesi. Hey, buddy. Oh, you're just gonna park yourself. She's sitting right in front of me. She's just kind of parked herself there. Okay. <sighs> Let's pick it up, pick it up. Pick it up, pick it up, pick it up. It's for a treasure hunt that my wife... Right, for your... Okay, this is still Gilpin, I think. It's difficult because I'm trying to figure out, like, who's talking. Let's start again so you can finish, you can get this correctly. Because if I break it up, it seems weird. <laughs> Gilpin smirked. Imagine our confusion. A missing persons case, and here we find an envelope marked first clue. It's for a treasure hunt that my wife... Right, for your anniversary. Your father-in-law mentioned it. I opened the envelope, pulled out a thick sky-blue piece of paper, Amy's signature stationery, folded once. Bile crept up my throat. These treasure hunts had always amounted to a single question. Who is Amy? What is my wife thinking? What was important to her this past year? What moments made her happiest? Amy, 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 let's think about Amy. I read the first clue with clenched teeth. Given our marital mood the past year, it was going to make me look awful. I didn't need anything else that made me look awful. I'm trying to think. I'll read this in Amy's voice. <laughs> I picture myself as your student, with a teacher so handsome and wise. My mind opens up, not to... What are you doing with this rhyming scheme, Amy? Are your pupil flowers. Okay, she does like a weird rhyme here, hold on. I picture myself as your student, with a teacher so handsome and wise. My mind opens up. Not to mention my thighs. If I were your pupil, there'd be no need for flowers. Maybe just a naughty appointment during your office hours. So hurry up, get going, please do. And this time, I'll teach you a thing or two. Yep, Amy's, Amy's horns in this also. Not just her own chapters. It was an itinerary for an alternate life. If things had gone according to my wife's vision yesterday, she would have hovered near me as I read the poem, watching me expectantly, the hope emanating from her like a, fe like a fever. Please get this. Please get me. And she would finally say, So? And I would say, Oh, I actually know this. She must be in my office at the junior college. I'm an adjunct professor there. Huh. I, I mean, it, it must be, right? I squinted and reread. She took it easy on me this year. You want me to drive you over? Gilpin asked. Nah, I've got Go's car. I'll follow you then. You think it's important? Well, it shows her movements the day or two before she went missing, so it's not unimportant. He looked at the stationery. It's sweet, you know? Like something out of a movie. A treasure hunt. My wife and I, we give each other a card and maybe get a bite to eat. Sounds like you guys were doing it right. Preserve the romance. Then Gilpin looked at his shoes, got bashful, and jingled his keys to leave. The college had rather grandly presented me with a coffin of an office, big enough for a desk, two chairs, some shelves. Gilpin and I wended our way through the summer school students, a combination of impossibly young kids, Bored yet busy, their fingers clicking out texts or dialing up music, and earnest older people, I had to assume, were mall layoffs, trying to retrain for a new career. What do you teach? Gilpin asked. Journalism. Magazine journalism. A girl texting and walking forgot the nuances of the latter and almost ran into me. She stepped to the side without glancing up. It made me feel cranky. Off my lawn, old... 
Well, I mean you are, bud. No, it's funny, though, because, like, that's one of the things that I've noticed uh, transitioning is I can just walk at people and they usually get out of my way. The entitlements of, like, some dudes will just, like, not, they expect you to move out of the way. Um, and I experienced that, that lot, a lot on the other side. And now that I'm like presenting mail, people just get out of my way. Like, I just look like a white dude, you know? And that's, uh, problematic in its own ways, but, uh, but I appreciate it. Mm. As a guy who loves mysteries, if somebody did this for me, I'd get very excited. Yeah, no, this is, um, I love it. I would, uh, for sure date Amy. This is, this is very cute. And, you know, I don't want to get too into the book because I don't want to spoil things. But, like, it's very sweet. Like, it's not this horrible thing where it's a test or anything. It's just like, you should be able to like joke around with your partner and like have this cute little thing. Like she, she cares enough that she did this like treasure hunt for you. Are you, God, I just, I wish I could switch places with Nick, I guess. I'd appreciate you, Amy. Let's see. What do you teach? Blah, blah, blah. Ah, here we go. I thought you didn't do journalism anymore. He who can't do, I smiled. I unlocked my office, stepped into the clothes... Clothes smelling? Clothes. Okay. I unlocked my office, stepped into the clothes smelling, dust-moted air. I'd taken the summer off. It had been weeks since I'd been here. On my desk sat another envelope, marked Second Clue. Your key always on your keychain? Gilpin asked. Yep. So Amy could have borrowed that to get in. I tore down the side of the envelope. And we have a spare at home. Amy made doubles of everything. I tended to misplace keys, credit cards, cell phones, but I didn't want to tell Gilpin this, get another baby of the family jab. Why? Oh, I just want to make sure she wouldn't have, wouldn't have had to go through. Oh, I see. Oh, I, I just wanted to make sure she wouldn't have had to go through, I don't know, a janitor or someone. No Freddy Krueger types here that I've noticed. That I've noticed. Never saw those movies, Gilpin replied. Neither have I. <laughs> 10 out of 10 would fuck Nick's wife. <laughs> Yeah, it's chilling to me that his takeaway from a gesture that that sweet is that it puts him on the spot for knowing literally nothing about his own wife's feelings. <laughs> yeah, it's oof. It's Nick sucks, man. God, just I just get angrier. Like I get angrier the more I read the book. Yeah, cause it's like a sweet thing, right? It's like a sweet, cute thing. It's not. It wouldn't be a test if you literally just paid attention to your wife at all or your relationship or anything really buddy it's fucking precious it is fucking precious <laughs> ah <sighs> Inside the envelope were two folded slips of paper. One was marked with a heart. The other was labeled Clue. Two notes? Different. My stomach clenched. God knew what Amy was going to say. I opened the note with the heart. I wish I hadn't let Gilpin come. And then I caught the first words. My darling husband. I figured this was the perfect place. These hollowed halls of learning. To tell you, I think you are a brilliant man. I don't tell you enough, but I am amazed by your mind. 
The weird statistics and anecdotes, the strange facts, the disturbing ability to quote from any movie, the quick wit, the beautiful way you have of wording things. After years together, I think a couple can forget how wonderful they find each other. I remember when we first met how dazzled I was by you. And so I want to take a moment to tell you I still am. And it's one of my favorite things about you. You are brilliant. My mouth watered. Gilpin was reading over my shoulder, and he actually sighed. Sweet lady, he said. Then he cleared his throat. Um, <clears> these <throat> yours? He used the eraser end of a pencil to pick up a pair of women's underwear. Technically, they were panties, stringy, lacy, red, but I know women get creeped out by that word. Just Google hate the word panties. That's, yes, um, I... <laughs> Uh, I'm not a girl, I'm assigned female at birth, though, and I can tell you panties is a bad word. I don't like it. If you, I can, if someone uses the word panties, I assume they watch anime. I can't. Uh, they'd been hanging off a knob on the AC unit. Oh, jeez, that's embarrassing. Gilpin waited for an explanation. Uh, one time Amy and I, well, you read her note. We kind of, you know, sometimes got to spice things up a little. Gilpin grinned. Oh, I get it. Randy professor, naughty student. I get it. You two really were doing it right. Oh, Gilpin's so cute. <laughs> uh, I reached for the underwear, but Gilpin was already producing an evidence bag from his pocket and sliding them in. Just a precaution he said inexplicably. Oh, please don't, I said. Amy would die. I caught myself. <laughs> don't worry, Nick. It's all protocol, my friend. You wouldn't believe the, the hoops we gotta jump through. Just in case, just in case. Ridiculous. What's the clue say? I let him read over my shoulder again, his jarringly fresh smell distracting me. So what's that one mean? He asked. I have no idea. I lied. Ooh, spicy. Um, yeah, it's interesting, I guess, because this part is also um, in the movie Boney does it. And I like that more. This is interesting. I like having two different reads on it. But in the movie, uh, they replace a lot of Gilpin's actions and lines with, uh, with Boney's. And she is... Um... <clears throat> Pardon me. <coughs> I just gotta drink some water real quick. Um, having Nick in all these scenes with a woman takes on a different meaning, you know what I mean? Because Nick is so Nick. That, uh... It's cool putting him in a, in a room with this, like... Boney is cool. She's a detective. She's, like, smart. And Nick having these misogynistic uh, ideals because of his father. I feel like he would be more nervous and more emasculated by Boney, you know, being in this room with him. <clears throat> Panty should be called thigh cozy. Yeah, I like that better. Because that makes it feel comfortable. <clears throat> I just got a like on TikTok from someone with the uh, with the username Gaotic Neutral. Oh, that's a great name. That's a really good name. An iconic username. Not gonna lie. Yeah, no, that's perfect. That's um, that's a very good name. Gaotic Neutral. <laughs> Whew. Let me just. Uh... Sorry, I remembered something that I needed to put on my. Perfect. I'm uh, keeping track of groceries more. I, I was organized before, but now I'm like, get on it. You gotta, because I, I can't just, if I run out of butter, I can't just go to the supermarket and just get butter. You know, you gotta like get everything in one shot. Do not throw away your shot. Okay, so... I'm not sure... 
because there were two notes. Did, did he read? He read the first one. Okay, I don't think they told us what was in the second note. I think they're they're revving up for it. Petition to add chaotic to the alignment chart in D and D. <laughs> yes, please. We got we got two petitions to sign that I'm really passionate about. One is one is uh, freezing rents, and the other is chaotic. <laughs> How to get to the alignment chart? <clears throat> I finally rid myself of Gilpin, then drove aimlessly down the highway so I could make a call on my disposable. No pickup. I didn't leave a message. I sped for a while longer, as if I could get anywhere. Then I turned around and drove the 45 minutes back toward town to meet the Elliots at the Days Inn. I walked into a lobby packed with members of the Midwest Payroll Vendors Association. Wheelie bags parked everywhere, their owners slurping complimentary drinks in small plastic cups and networking. Forced guttural laughs and pockets fished for business cards. I rode up the elevator with four men, all balding and khakied and golf-shirted, lanyards bouncing off round married bellies. Mary Beth opened the door while talking on her cell phone. She pointed toward the TV and whispered to me, We have a cold-cut tray if you want, sweetheart. Then went into the bathroom and closed the door, her murmurs continuing. She emerged a few minutes later, just in time for the local five o'clock news from St. Louis, which led with Amy's disappearance. Perfect photo, Mary Beth murmured at the screen, where Amy peered back at us. People will see it and really know what Amy looks like. I thought the portrait, a headshot from Amy's brief fling with acting, beautiful, but upsetting. Upsettling. Is that a word? I guess I've never seen upset. Oh, unsettling. Okay. I read it as upset, and then I read it as upsettling, and then I'm like, unsettling. Cool. Okay, let's try that again. I thought the portrait, a headshot from Amy's brief fling with acting, beautiful, but unsettling. Amy's pictures gave a sense of her actually watching you, like an old-time haunted house portrait, the eyes moving left to right. We should get them some candid photos, too, I said. Some everyday ones. The Elliots nodded in tandem, but said nothing, watching. When the spot was done, Rand broke the silence. I feel sick. I know, Mary Beth said. How are you holding up, Nick? Rand asked, hunched over, hands on both knees as if he were preparing to get up from the sofa, but couldn't quite do it. I'm a goddamn mess, to tell the truth. I feel so useless. You know, I gotta ask, what about your employees, Nick? Rand finally stood. He went to the mini bar, poured himself a ginger ale, then turned to me and Mary Beth. Anyone? Something? Anything? I shook my head. Mary Beth asked for a club soda. Want some gin with it too, babe? Rand asked, his deep voice going high on the final word. Interesting, so it was probably like, Want some gin with it with a two? Wait, yes. Want some gin with a two, babe? This is like a <sighs> sure. Yes, I do. Mary Beth closed her eyes, bent in half, and brought her face between her knees. Then she took a deep breath and sat back up in her exact previous position, as if it were all a yoga exercise. I gave them lists of everyone. I said, but it's a pretty tame business, Rand. I just don't think that's the place to look. Rand put a hand across his mouth and rubbed upwards, the flesh of his, te the flesh of his cheeks bunching up around his eyes. Of course, we're doing the same with our business, Nick. Rand and Mary Beth always referred to the Amazing Amy series as a business, which on the surface never failed to strike me as silly. They are children's books about a perfect little girl who's pictured on every book cover, a cartoonish version of my own Amy. But of course, they are, were, a business, big business. They were elementary school staples for the better part of two decades, largely, largely because of the quizzes at the end of each chapter. In third grade, for instance, Amazing Amy caught her friend Brian overfeeding the class turtle. She tried to reason with him, but when Brian persisted in the extra helpings, 
Amy had no choice but to nark on him to her teacher. Mrs. Tibbles, I don't want to be a tattletale, but I'm not sure what to do. I've tried talking to Brian myself, but now I guess I might need help from a grown-up. The Fallout 1. Brian told Amy she was an untrustworthy friend and stopped talking to her. 2. Her timid pal Susie said Amy shouldn't have told. She should have secretly fished out the food without Brian knowing. 3. Amy's arch-rival, Joanna, said Amy was jealous and just wanted to feed the turtle herself. 4. Amy refused to back down. She felt she did the proper thing. Who is right? Well, that's easy, because Amy is always right, in every story. Don't think I haven't brought this up in my arguments with my real Amy, because I have more than once. The quizzes, written by two psychologists who are also parents like you, were supposed to tease out a child's personality traits. Is your wee one a sulker who can't stand to be corrected, like Brian? A spineless enabler, like Susie? A pot stirrer, like Joanna? Or perfect, like Amy? The books became extremely trendy among the rising yuppie class. They were the pet rock of parenting, the Rubik's Cube of child rearing. The Elliots got rich. At one, point it would est at one point, it was estimated that every school library in America had an Amazing Amy book. Do you have worries that this might link back to the Amazing Amy business? I asked. We do have a few people who thought it might be worth checking out, Rand, be Rand began. I coughed out a laugh. Do you think Judah Vorst? Vorst? Ooh, how do we pronounce this? Vorst? Let's do it. Do you think Judah Vorst kidnapped Amy for Alexander so he wouldn't have any more terrible, horrible, no good, very bad days? Oh, I see. Because the book. I get it. <laughs> That's the problem. Parents don't understand kids at all. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like the writing for, you know, things where you could tell where it was like a dude in his like 40s writing for like a teenage girl and you're like, this, this doesn't feel right. Rand and Mary Beth turned matching, surprised, disappointed faces towards me. It was a gross, tasteless thing to say. My brain had been burping up such inappropriate thoughts at inopportune moments. Mental gas I couldn't control. Like, I'd started internally singing the lyrics to Boney Maroney whenever I saw my cop friend. She's as skinny as a stick of macaroni, my brain would bebop as Detective Rhonda Boney was telling me about dragging the river for my missing wife. Defense mechanism, I told myself. Just a weird defense mechanism. I'd like it to stop. I rearranged my leg delicately, spoke delicately, as if my words were an unwieldy stack of fine china. I'm sorry, I don't know why I said that. We're all tired, Rand offered. We'll have the cops round up Bjorst, Mary Beth tried, and that bitch Beverly Cleary too. It was less a joke than a pardon. I, I guess I should tell you, I said. The cops, it's normal in this kind of case to look at the husband first, I know, Rand interrupted. I told them they're wasting their time. The questions they asked us, they were offensive, Mary Beth finished. So they have spoken with you uh, about me? I moved over to the mini bar, casually poured a drin, uh, <laughs> a drin is what I said because I combined gin and drink. Casually poured a gin. I swallowed three belts in a row and felt immediately worse. My stomach was working its way up my esophagus. What kind of stuff did they ask? Have you ever hurt Amy? Has Amy ever mentioned you threatening her? Mary Beth ticked off. Are you a womanizer? Has Amy ever mentioned you cheating on her? Because that sounds like Amy, right? I told them we didn't raise a doormat. No. <laughs> Oh, it hurts. Because it's, it's, um... I've seen it with myself. I've seen it with friends. It's just a thing where... This book speaks to assigned female at birth people very specifically. Um, just because 
you can have a very strong uh, assigned female at birth person where in their personal life everything is so like they take charge and they're like go-getters and stuff like that and then they'll just be like controlled by a dude and it's it they just because you can see you know from from amy's diary entry is that like it's so it hits home for a lot of people this this story you know because it's like damn if you're like this in real life why are you all of a sudden letting a dude walk all over you and it's just psychology is weird <laughs> and I love that one of the things I asked was, are you a womanizer? Like, yeah, Nick, you're, you're. Rand put a hand on my shoulder. Nick, what we should have said. Oh, Nick, what we should have said, first of all, is we know you would never, ever hurt Amy. I even told the police. I, I told them the story about you saving the mouse at the beach house, saving it from the glue trap. He looked over at Mary Beth as if she didn't know the story, and Mary Beth obliged with her rapt attention. Spent an hour trying to corner the damn thing, and then literally drove the little rat bastard out of town. Does that sound like a guy who'd hurt his wife? I felt a burst of intense guilt, self-loathing. I thought for a second I might cry, finally. We love you, Nick, Rand said, giving me a final squeeze. We do, Nick, Mary Beth echoed. You're our son. We are so incredibly sorry that on top of Amy being gone, you have to deal with this cloud of suspicion. I didn't like the phrase cloud of suspicion. I much preferred routine investigation or a mere formality. They did wonder about your res... Oh, who is this? Oh, it's Mary Beth. They did worry... They did wonder about your restaurant reservations that night. Mary Beth said, an overly casual glance. My reservations? They said you told them you had reservations at Houston's, but they checked it out and there were no reservations. They seemed really interested in that. I had no reservation and I had no gift, because if I planned on killing Amy that day, I wouldn't have needed reservations for that night or a gift I'd never need to give her. The hallmarks of an extremely pragmatic killer. I am pragmatic to a fault. My friends could certainly tell you, my friends could certainly tell the police that. Uh, no. No, I, I never made reservations. They must have misunderstood me. I'll let them know. I collapsed on the couch across from Mary Beth. I didn't want Rand to touch me again. Oh, okay. Good. Mary Beth said. Did she, uh, did you get a treasure hunt this year? Her eyes turned red again. Before? Yeah, they, they gave me the first clue today. Gilpin and I found the second one in my office at the college. I'm still trying to figure it out. Can we take a look? My mother-in-law asked. I don't have it with me. I lied. Will you... Will you try to solve it, Nick? Mary Beth asked. I will, Mary Beth. I'll solve it. I just, I hate the idea of things she touched, left out there all alone. My phone rang, the disposable, and I flicked a glance at the display, then shut it off. I needed to get rid of the thing, but I couldn't yet. You should pick up every call, Nick, Mary Beth said. I, I recognize this one, just my college alum fund looking for money. Rand sat beside me on the couch. The ancient, much abused cushion sank severely under our weight, so we ended up pushed against each other arms touching. Which was fine with Rand. He was one of those guys who'd pronounce I'm a hugger as he came at you, neglecting to ask if the feeling was mutual. Mary Beth returned to business. We do think it's possible an Amy obsessive took her. She turned to me as if pleading a case. We've had him over the years. Amy had been fond of recollecting stories of men obsessed with her. She described the stalkers in hus oh. <laughs> she described the stalkers in hushed tones over glasses of wine at various periods during our marriage. Men who were still out there, always thinking about her and wanting her. I suspected these stories were inflated. 
The men always came off as dangerous to a very precise degree. Enough for me to worry about, but not enough to require us to involve the police. In short, a play world where I could be Amy's chest-puffed hero, defending her honor. Amy was too independent, too modern, to be able to admit the truth. She wanted to play damsel. Oosh. Lately? Not lately, no. <clears throat> oh wait, that's, that's Mary Beth. Uh, lately? Not lately, no. Mary Beth said, chewing her lip. But there was a very disturbed girl back in high school. Uh, disturbed how? She was obsessed with Amy. Well, with amazing Amy. Her name was Hilary Handy. She modeled herself after Amy's best friend in the book, Susie. At first it was cute, I guess. And then it was like that wasn't good enough anymore. She wanted to be amazing Amy, not Susie the sidekick. So, so she began imitating our Amy. She dressed like Amy, she colored her hair blonde, she'd linger outside our house in New York. One time I was walking down the street and she came running up to me, this strange girl, and she looped her arm through mine and said, I'm going to be your daughter now. I'm going to kill Amy and be your new Amy, because it doesn't really matter to you, does it? As long as you have an Amy. Like our daughter was a piece of fiction she could rewrite. We finally got a restraining order because she threw Amy down a flight of stairs at school, Rand said. Very disturbed girl. That kind of mentality doesn't go away. And then Desi, Mary Beth said. And Desi, Rand said. Even I knew about Desi. Amy had attended a Massachusetts boarding school called Wickshire Academy. I had seen the photos. Amy in lacrosse skirts and headbands, always with autumn colors in the background, as if the school were based not in a town, but in a month. Now, this character is played by Neil Patrick Harris, so if you would like to imagine Neil, you can. If not, you can come up with your own shit. October. Desi Collings attended the boys' boarding school that was paired with Wickshire. In Amy's stories, he was a pale, romantic figure, and their courtship had been of the boarding school variety. Chilly football games and overheated dances, lilac corsages and rides in a vintage jaguar. Everything a little bit mid-century. Amy dated Desi quite seriously for a year, but she began to find him alarming. He talked as if they were engaged. He knew the number and gender of their children. They were going to have four kids, all boys, which sounded suspiciously like Desi's own family. And when he brought his mother down to meet her, Amy grew queasy at the striking resemblance between herself and Mrs. Collings. The older woman had kissed her cheek coldly and murmured calmly in her ear, Good luck. Amy couldn't tell if it was a warning or a threat. After Amy cut it off with Desi, he still lingered around the Wickshire campus, a ghostly figure in dark blazers, leaning against wintry, leafless oak trees. Amy returned from a dance one February night to find him lying on her bed, naked on top of the covers, groggy from a very marginal pill overdose. Desi left school shortly after. But he still phoned her, even now and several times a year sent her thick, padded envelopes that Amy tossed unopened after showing them to me. They were postmarked St. Louis, 40 minutes away. It's just a horrible, miserable coincidence, she told me. Desi had the St. Louis family connections on his mother's side. This much she knew, but didn't care to know more. I'd picked through the trash to retrieve one, read the letter, sticky with Alfredo sauce, and it had been utterly banal. Talk of tennis and travel and other things preppy. Spaniels. I tried to picture this slender dandy, a fellow in bow ties and turquoise shell glasses, busting into our house and grabbing Amy with soft, manicured fingers, tossing her the trunk of his vintage roadster and taking her antiquing in Vermont. Desi. Could anyone believe it was Desi? Uh, Desi lives not far away, actually, I said. St. Louis. Now, see, Rand said, why are the cops not all over this? Someone needs to be, I said. I'll go. After the search here tomorrow. The police definitely seem to think it's close to home, Mary Beth said. 
She kept her eyes on me one beat too long, then shivered, as if shaking off a thought. Hmm. Ah, St. Louis, the city that has not gone a single week without a shooting in decades. Yeah, I would not know. <laughs> Cucumber, it's funny because I saw your line from when we were talking about uh, the Amazing Amy series and you said, that's the problem. Parents don't understand kids at all. And I read it to the, the song lyrics. You know, parents just don't understand. <laughs> that's the problem. Parents don't understand kids at all. It's too many syllables. <laughs> Amy Elliott Dunn, August 23rd, 2010. Diary Entry Summer, birdies, sunshine. I spent today shuffling around Prospect Park, my skin slender, I'm sorry, my skin tender, <laughs> my bones brittle, misery battling. It is an improvement since I spent the previous three days in our house in the same crusty pajama set, marking time until five when I could have a drink, trying to make myself remember the suffering in Darfur, put things into perspective, which I guess is just further exploiting the people of Darfur. So much has unraveled the past week. I think that's what it is, that it's all happened at once. So I have the emotional bends. Nick lost his job a month ago. The recession is supposed to be winding down, but no one seems to know that. So Nick lost his job. Second round of layoffs, just like he predicted, just a few weeks after the first round. Oops, we didn't fire nearly enough people. Idiots. At first, I think Nick might be okay. He makes a massive list of things he's always meant to do. Some of it's tiny stuff. He changes watch batteries and resets clocks. He replaces a pipe beneath our sink and repaints all the rooms we painted before and didn't like. Basically, he does a lot of things over. It's nice to take some actual do-overs when you get so few in life. And then he starts on bigger stuff. He reads War and Peace. He flirts with taking Arabic lessons. He spends a lot of time trying to guess what skills will be marketable over the next few decades. It breaks my heart, but I pretend it doesn't for his sake. I keep asking him, are you sure you're okay? At first I try it seriously. Over coffee, eye contact, my hand on his. Then I try it breezily, lightly, in passing. Then I try it tenderly, in bed, stroking his hair. He has the same answer, always. I'm fine. I don't really want to talk about it. I wrote a quiz that was perfect for the times. <laughs> How are you handling your layoff? A. I sit in my pajamas and eat a lot of ice cream. Sulking is therapeutic. B. I write nasty things about my old boss online, everywhere. Venting feels great. C. Until a new job comes along, I try to find useful things to do with my newfound time, like learning a marketable language, or finally reading War and Peace. It was a compliment to Nick. C was the correct answer. But he just gave a sour smile when I showed it to him. A few weeks in, the bustling stopped. The usefulness stopped as if he woke up one morning under a decrepit, dusty sign that read, Why fucking bother? He went dull-eyed. Now he watches TV, surfs porn, watches porn on TV. He eats a lot of delivery food, the styrofoam shells propped up near the overflowing trash can. He doesn't talk to me. He behaves as if the act of talking physically pains him, and I am a vicious woman to ask it of him. He barely shrugs when I tell him I was laid off last week. That's awful, I'm sorry, he says. At least you have your money to fall back on. We have the money. I liked my job, though. He starts singing, You Can't Always Get What You Want, off-key, high-pitched, with a little stumbling dancing, and I realize he is drunk. It is late afternoon, a beautiful blue-blue day, and our house is dank, thick with the sweet smell of rotting Chinese food, the curtains all drawn over and I begin walking room to room to air it out, pulling back the drapes, scaring the dust motes. And when I reach the darkened den, I stumble over a bag on the floor, and then another and another, like the cartoon cat who walks into a room full of mouse traps. I love, it. I love how she said the room is dank. 
A is your answer. <laughs> you sit in your pajamas and eat a lot of ice cream. Sulking is therapeutic. Hell yeah. Do what you gotta. When I switch on the lights... Oh, sorry. <laughs> when I switch on the lights, I see dozens of shopping bags, and they are from places laid off people don't go. They are the high-end men's stores, the places that hand tailor suits where salespeople carry ties individually draped over an arm to male shoppers nestled in leather armchairs. I mean, the shit is bespoke. What is all this, Nick? For job interviews, if anyone ever starts hiring again. You need it so much? We do have the money. He smiles at me grimly, his arms crossed. Do you at least want to hang them up? Uh, several of the plastic coverings have been chewed apart by Bleaker. A tiny mound of cat vomit lays near one... Th oh, <laughs> a tiny mound of cat vomit lays near one $3,000 suit. A tailored white shirt is covered in orange fur where the cat has napped. Not really. Nope, he said. He grins at me. I have never been a nag. I have always been rather proud of my unnagginess. So it pisses me off that Nick is forcing me to nag. I'm willing to live with a certain amount of sloppiness, of laziness, of the lackadaisal life. I realize that I am more type A than Nick, and I try to be careful not to inflict my neat, freaky, to-do list nature on him. Nick is not the kind of guy who is going to think to vacuum or clean out the fridge. He truly doesn't see that kind of stuff. Fine. Really. But I, I do like a certain standard of living. I think it's fair to say the garbage shouldn't literally overflow, and the plates shouldn't sit in the sink for a week with smears of bean burrito dried on them. That's just being a good grown-up roommate. And Nick's not doing anything anymore, so I, I have to nag and it pisses me off. You are turning me into what I never have been and never wanted to be, a nag, because you are not living up to your end of a very basic com compact? I would have thought it would be contract, but okay. Uh, because you are not living up to your end of a very basic compact. Don't do that. It's not okay to do. And that was all in italics, so she wasn't speaking out loud. <laughs> dank air horn. Oh shit, that house is fucking dank as fuck, bro. Boy. <laughs> uh, I know, I know, I know that losing a job is incredibly stressful, and particularly for a man. They say it could be like a death in the family, and especially for a man like Nick, who has always worked. So I take a giant breath, roll my anger up into a red rubber ball, and mentally kick it out into space. Well, do you mind if I hang these up, just so they stay nice for you? Knock yourself out. His and her layoffs, isn't that sweet? I know we are luckier than most. I go online and check my trust fund whenever I get nervous. I never called it a trust fund before Nick did. It's actually not that grand. I, I mean, it's nice. It's great. $785,404 that I have in savings, thanks to my parents. But it's not the kind of money that allows you to stop working forever, especially not in New York. My parents' whole point was to make me feel secure enough so I didn't need to make choices based on money, in schooling, in career, but not so well off that I could be tempted to check out. Nick makes fun, but I, I think it's a great <laughs> Nick makes fun, but I, I think it's a great gesture for parents to make, and appropriate considering they plagiarized my childhood for the books. But I'm still feeling sick about the layoff, our layoffs, when my dad calls and asks if he and mom can stop by. They need to talk to us. This afternoon, now, actually, if it's okay. Of course it's okay, I say, and in my head I think, cancer, cancer, cancer. My parents appear at the door, looking like they've put up an effort. My father is thoroughly pressed and tucked and shined, impeccable except for the grooves behind his eyes. My mother is in one of her bright purple dresses that she always wore to speeches and ceremonies back when she got those invitations. She says the color demands confidence of the wearer. They look great, but they seem ashamed. I usher them to the sofa, and we all sit silently for a second. Kids, your mother and I, we seem to have... 
My father finally starts, then stops to cough. He places his hands on his knees, his big knuckles pale. We seem to have gotten ourselves into a hell of a financial mess. I don't know what my reaction is supposed to be. Shocked? Consoling? Disappointed? My parents have never confessed any troubles to me. I don't think they've had many troubles. The fact of the matter is, we've been irresponsible. Marybeth continues. We've been living the past decade like we were making the same kind of money we did for the previous two decades, and we weren't. We haven't made half that, but we were in denial. We were optimistic, maybe a kind way to put it. We just kept thinking the next Amy book would do the trick, but that hasn't happened. And we kept making bad decisions. We invested foolishly. We spent foolishly. And now, we're basically broke, Rand says. Our house, as well as this house, it's all underwater. I thought, assumed, they would bought this house for us outright. I had no idea they were making payments on it. I feel a sting of embarrassment that I am as sheltered as Nick says. Like I said, we made some serious judgment errors, Mary Beth says. We should write a book, Amazing Amy and the Adjustable Rate Mortgage. We would flunk every quiz. We'd be the cautionary tale. Amy's friend, when do you want it now? Harry head, Harry head in the sand, Rand adds. So what happens next? I ask. That is entirely up to you, my dad says. My mom fishes out a homemade pamphlet from her purse and sets it on the table in front of us. Bars and graphs and pie charts created on their home computer. It kills me to picture my parents squinting over the user's manual, trying to make their proposition look pretty for me. Mary Beth starts the pitch. We wanted to ask if we could borrow some money from your trust while we figure out what to do with the rest of our lives. My parents sit in front of us like two. Um, my parents sit in front of us like two eager college kids hoping for their first internship. My father's knee jiggles until my mother places a gentle fingertip on it. Well, the trust fund is your money, so of course you can borrow from it. I said. I just want this to be over. The hopeful look on my parents' face. I I, I can't stand it. How much do you think you need? to pay everything off and feel comfortable for a while. My father looks at his shoes. My mother takes a deep breath. 650000 she says. Oh. It is all I can say. It is almost everything we have. Amy, maybe you and I should discuss, Nick begins. No, no, we can do this, I say. I'll just go grab my checkbook. Actually, Mary Beth says, if you could wire it to our account tomorrow, that would be best. Otherwise, there's a 10-day waiting period. That's when I know they are in serious trouble. That's the end of the chapter. And I think that's where we, were, where we are uh, ending for tonight. Hell yeah. Oh, fuck, if I had that much money, I'd buy that $800 Lego Millennium Falcon. Oh, fuck yeah. No, that kind of money, like, oh, I would get LASIK, I would get my penis, like, fuck yo, that, like, <laughs> I guess technically it's penis enlargement, because I got one, I just want one that's like, you know, uh, what did we call it, the party penis, <laughs> I want a party penis, um, good evening to you, hello, mother Nerset, how are y'all, <laughs> oh shit, uh, Chonage, thank you so much for the follow. Really appreciate it. Um, thanks for reading for us. Thank you for coming. Uh, this is super fun. Um, I'm getting to stretch my legs a bit because I haven't, uh, with the state of things, I haven't really been doing a lot of voice acting recently. Um, my last session was when I was in Texas. A month or so ago. <laughs> you need a moonstone to evolve your penis. Hell yeah. Uh, what would a good... There's different stones, and I don't know which one would be the best dick pun. Firestone. There's a joke somewhere. I'll craft it. I'll craft it, and I'll think of it later. I'll be sleeping. I'll be in bed and think of it, and I'll shoot up in the middle of the night and be like, that's what I should have said. Um, 
But yeah, thank y'all for joining me. It's, uh, what day is it today right now? It is Wednesday. Uh, so I've been trying to stream, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So, Waterstone because it makes people wet. I like that. That's a, that's a good contender. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like that. That's, that's the, that's, that's the winner in my book so far. But, um... Yeah, if you'll join me in another day, we will continue in another day. Literally one more day. Uh, hard stone in all caps. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, this is this has been great. Um, yeah, no, I I've always wanted to do a reading stream, so this is very cool that we get to read a book that is significant uh, to me. I feel like um, an English teacher, which is real dope because i would have been an english teacher i think if i hadn't gone for my ideal career but uh thank you so much for the bits thank you for the follows uh this has been dope uh check below for updated stream schedule and i hope you all stay safe and wash your hands and be gentle with yourselves i'll see you in uh yeah one day 24 48 hours whatever the fuck um Love y'all. See you later.